being a social entrepreneur is a, is a fully human thing. You know, hands on, sweating it out, looking at the long term, your ears attuned to what the customer's saying, using your voice to inspire and influence people, your head in the business plan, your heart in your social mission, and the guts to survive the difficult times. It isn't any one thing that makes you succeed. It isn't skill or passion or character or action or business plans or whatever. It's all of them put together and every part of yourself. It is a, a fully human leadership thing. And if anybody is sat here thinking that it's an intellectual exercise of the perfect business plan, think again. It's something that takes all of you. It's a whole life experience. Our world is changing very fast and every time I, I uh, sort of do a talk, I have to think, well, no, those are yesterday's new things. What's today's new things? Um, the world is changing so fast, an aging society, homelessness, global warming, the fab lab revolution just across the road, um, neuroscience, personal genomics, diversity, the collapse of politics yesterday, the collapse of, of belief and trust in public institutions, all of these things need uh, social entrepreneurs to help on them. And it's people who understand how the poor and the disadvantaged live their lives, people who understand the solutions that will work, cheaply, effectively, solutions that are appealing, engaging, sticky. Um, those solutions aren't going to come from big business or big government. They're not going to, it's no more than uh, LinkedIn came out of the career service. It didn't. It was a completely sideways, disruptive innovation. Sotheby's didn't invent eBay. It was a completely sideways, disruptive innovation. The solutions will come from people like you, not from the established players. Probably about a year ago, uh, during my second year of medicine, um, I started getting really ill, and doctors, they just couldn't diagnose me, um, and they couldn't help me uh, change my behavior to um, follow, follow their wrong guidelines as well. Um, so that kind of like uh, made me really angry, I suppose. And then from then, um, I started seeing all these problems uh, within the healthcare system. Um, and I started going to a lot of uh, conferences to try and understand these problems more. Uh, and through that, I met, I met my mentor. And um, through my mentor and uh, Unlimited with uh, Michael, um, it really helped me do something useful. We're creating innovative preventative medicine solutions to today's major non communicable healthcare problems. So, Western healthcare problems, essentially. Uh, so, presently, we are, um, these are the three projects we're working on. Um, so, it's the Food Hourglass app, uh, which will teach you how to optimize your diet according to the world's best scientific evidence and um, adopt optimally healthy eating habits. Um, and I'm writing a book called Modern Medical School, um, which will teach doctors um, everything they should have been taught in medical school, but they, they haven't really been uh, taught. A, a metric we use in our company is called the quality to time ratio. So uh, a quality is, it stands, it's an acronym, Q-A-L-Y, and it stands for quality adjusted life year. We use it in medicine quite a bit. So the quality to time ratio, essentially, is how many years of good health you add to people's lives each year. So once you start understanding this, you can really, you know, figure out how much impact you're having and how to scale that to 100, 1,000 times more. So for example, uh, my friend, um, Dr. Chris Verberg, who's recently written a book called The Food Hourglass. Uh, he's a medical doctor and he's, um, his book, which is uh, what inspired me to make the app, uh, depicts the optimal human diet. So he's sold 500,000 copies in the first six months. And you can assume that on average, maybe, uh, each person will benefit, will gain 30 days of good health, a month of good health from the book. So if you work that out, that's the work of 10 surgeons or 50,000 qualities. But then it gets interesting because Chris is doing irreplaceable work. No one would have done, written that book uh, as well as he, he would have if he hadn't written it. Surgeons, for example, are entirely irreplaceable. There's large competition for medical school places. Um, Anyone could have done the work that they do each year. So Chris is doing irreplaceable work. And what's more, he's um, contributing to a butterfly effect of healthcare impact. So for example, um, people who read his book 
Uh, they'll, their friends will become healthier as well because that's how social dynamics works. And also, for example, he's inspired me to uh, make the Food Hourglass app, which should have social impact as well. And all of this, is, all of this comes back to his original one year of work writing the Food Hourglass book. So rather than the work of 10 surgeons over the longevity of the book, his one year of work for the book eventually has maybe 10 times or more impact than it would in his first year. So he's doing the work of 100 or 1,000 surgeons in one year. So when I was a student, I, I studied for six years as a life science student, and I wanted to do something outside of academia, but I did not know what that was. And I did not have any avenue to understand what the world was outside of the university. And so I found this problem, I stumbled a bit, and I was able to, with the support of several people, establish an organization that is actually solving the social needs of life science and medical students. We're tackling their strategic decisions to help them make informed decisions for their careers to take them to the next level beyond education. So it's about translating their skills and educational knowledge into a career path that would make them fulfilled and achieve beyond their imagination. I never saw myself as an entrepreneur until I was faced with a problem I was eager to solve to provide the service that I wish I had as a life science student for my other you know, colleagues who are on their journey so they don't make the mistakes I made. I'd like to identify some lessons I've learned along the way. First is that I've learned to ask help. Prior to this, I used to feel I could you know, achieve beyond my imagination, but I felt I could do everything. I felt I was self-sufficient. But when I started this journey, I knew I could not achieve all the results we wanted because I couldn't do it on my own. And we've achieved so much from help from mentors, from help from Kings, from different departments at Kings, from friends, from different organizations, and we're grateful. Also, um, I've also learned that minor setbacks actually are not, um, it's not the end of the world. I've, I've, I've learned to keep my focus on the big picture. And our big picture is to mold the future of science one student at a time, one life science student at a time, and one medical student at a time. And um, finally, um, one of my mentors says something. The, he says to me, get moving and the way we open. Get moving, the resources, the people, the time, the finance you need will all come rushing to you. And that's what I've learned. Because I can attest to the fact that when I started Mind Torch, I knew no one. I had no idea how I was going to do this. But because I was able to speak to as many people as possible, I was able to ask for help. I got support from Kings, fantastic support from FKE and Unlimited in terms of finance, resources, people, mentors, advice, connections, everything we needed to achieve beyond our expectations. Basically, my story is about four and a half years ago, I went traveling and backpacking around Southeast Asia, and I was really impacted by the people I met and the things I saw. Um, prior to this, I was very fortunate to get a job working on a DFID funded project in India, and this sort of was what taught me about development. And um, taking those skills, traveling, you sort of see, you see communities and groups, and you see ways they could improve things, you see ways they could access new markets, and it just really changed my outlook on life. And when I was in Cambodia particularly, I was really overwhelmed by the number of children I saw on the street. And uh, I was volunteering for a school there, working with street children. And, um, and when I was there, it really sort of hit home that like, for, for most of these kids, like, life sucks um, compared to our Western standards. So me and a friend were thinking, and we were, we were sort of like doing some research. And we found the common trait is that, uh, was that no parent wants to let their child enter into this cycle. No parent wants their child to be begging on the streets. No parent wants to, to ship their child off to a factory for $22 a month uh, so, that, so that they can afford to live and eat. Um, so what Fike does is we work with the families and we, we train the parents and give them a microloan for a sewing machine and then they work from home and they produce goods for us that we then sell in the UK. And every time we sell one, we give a percentage of the sale to our foundation that then funds education projects in Cambodia. 
So that's, uh, that's where the children, um, parents, parents earning, children learning comes from. Initially, we pitched it at um, an LSE competition in about, I think, 2012. And, um, and we got through under like 400 applications to the final 10, and we pitched on the day. It was our first experience pitching. At this stage, it was just an idea. It was just like, what if we could do this? You know, like the, the idea I had for a while, like, what if we could turn this into something more? And it was at this point we received feedback that we were like, oh my gosh, this could be a business. After that was actually getting the product. You can see here in the, in the photo, this was our first order. It was just one box of product. Uh, the products are made from recycled cement bags and they were absolutely awful. Uh, there was lots of limited editions because there were lots of problems. So whenever a problem came, whenever, whenever the wrong color came, the wrong design came, it was limited edition. Uh, people loved it. <laughs> With marketing your brand, you know, if, if you're gonna approach a retailer, you need to have some good marketing. You need to have a good website, some good marketing materials. Because if uh, I was remember going to a meeting with, um, with Selfridges, and you know they love the concept, they love the idea, but our website was awful. And until they looked at the website, I thought we'd sold them. But our, our web presence was terrible, and that was a really, really, really like serious lesson learned at the beginning of our journey. You know, your story has to be spot on. Like this is our story on a page. This is um, probably a bit too much. But you need to be able to summarise what you do in a sentence. And someone needs to be able to understand it. You know, and parents learning, um, uh, children learning, parents earning. That's, that's us in a statement. So you need to be very clear from the beginning about what are you selling, who are you selling to, where's the social impact. We realised very quickly that um, reaching buyers was difficult. So how do you, you know, we were going through telephone directories, we were going through on online directories. We were going through just everywhere and you'd find a contact and then maybe that person didn't work there anymore or or maybe that wasn't the right person and it was very hard to get a hold of them in the first place because there were lots of gatekeepers so how do you get past the gatekeeper um we found it very difficult so we started doing trade shows and it was a huge success for us um on our first trade shows we, uh, trade show we got about 12 new customers out orders out the show and um quite quite a, quite a lot of orders after the show and this like, helped the business to perpetually grow. And I think uh, capitalism is good. And I think that profit is good. And I think that the distribution of it is even better. I was a, a business management uh, student here, mostly based actually over the river on the, the management centre at Waterloo, um, but also popping over here for occasional uh, language sessions. So I remember it fondly. I think I always watch my parents um, trying to use their company proactively to raise money and you know, support causes, support charity projects. So that was always something that, that for me growing up as a kid was present in my life. So I think I probably sucked some of that up. Um, but it really wasn't until I left school and having spent um, sort of six months in you know, working for fancy fashion brands in Paris and Milan that I then decided to do something completely different. And I went to the Southeast Uganda um, and with an organization, worked up in the mountains, um, very remote, very rural area, close to the Kenyan border. And I think initially I thought, Christ, you know, what can I really do? We were there to, we were there primarily focused around working with young people um, to teach them about sexual and reproductive health education. Um, at the time, 8,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 24 uh, were dying with AIDS-related illnesses. Um, and, you know, um, teenage pregnancy was one of, and still continues to be, one of the leading killers of young women, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we were there to, to teach what was ultimately some quite delicate teenage health information um, to large classrooms of up to 150 kids um, who could very barely speak English, let, let alone understand um, these kinds of delicate complexities, complexities that were mired in taboo. And within six months, those youngsters had taken on board this information. We'd been creative in the way that we were, we were teaching them. And they staged a health day in their village where they took over and through music, song, poetry, dance, drama, they taught their friends, they taught their families, they taught their wider community 
about those issues. Um, and it was a huge sort of inspirational light bulb moment for me in terms of thinking, wow, this stuff really works. You know, and young people are the same, um, you know, really wherever they are, and with the right support, um, the right guidance, the right information, and the right approach, you know, they can be, they can be taught to, to make healthy choices, they can be taught to empower themselves and, you know, those around them. I was living and working in partnership with another English girl and two Ugandan boys. Um, Hannah, who, the English girl, came back from the craft market in Kampala with this bag made out of um, recycled metal bottle tops. And I was just like, oh my God, that is super cool. Um, it's like a piece of pop art. Um, and we were, I just, it immediately sort of captured my imagination. And I was like, I, I know that I could sell tons of those back home. Um, I think Hannah thought I was completely, you know, tripping. And so at the end of my first term at King's, um, my dad, who founded Mulberry, the English luxury, you know, fashion accessory company, um, he had someone drop out of the business at short notice who was wholesaling the menswear collection. And I was like, I was like, hey, I've done, you know, I've been teaching classrooms of 150 kids, you know, how hard could it be to, you know, sell, sell fancy handbags to, to, to people running stores? So I stepped in and was working within Mulberry when finally, six months later, the bottle top bags arrived in the showroom. And I remember unpacking them and everyone at the company just being like, what the hell is that? Um, and they, they would, but they were transfixed by it. You know, I think for anyone who had traveled in Africa, they'd possibly seen one of these bags or one of these kinds of bags on the craft markets of, you know, in Cape Town or Nairobi or wherever, but not the wider, you know, populace. And I think at this point, this was kind of before any social enterprise. We were, we were at a moment there back in 2002 where it was high fashion, you know, or it was charities making really crap products and selling them purely on the basis that people would maybe buy them because they felt guilty and they would get a really badly fitting t-shirt that they would never wear again. So I was kind of looking at these two different worlds and here was the bottle top bag. And so I sat down with dad and the design team and my dad had visited me when I was in Uganda um, and had been super inspired by the work that we were doing. He really saw and felt the value of the work that we were doing. And I was, of course, completely passionate about it, which going back to Cliff's point and, and really everyone's point, you've got to be passionate, otherwise you're not even going to get off the starting blocks. We devised what we called the Mulberry Bottle Top campaign. Um, and we launched it. We did a big photo campaign with David Bailey, um, with various you know, people of the, of the time, from Bob Geldof to Nana Cherry, wearing sort of one-off couture pieces that we created out of leather and using bottle tops and you know, beautifully handmade pieces. And it really just captured the imagination. Um, it became the best-selling bag of the season for Mulberry internationally. Um, it generated probably about 150,000 pounds through the sale of the bags um, and also then through the events that we started to, to do to really promote the whole campaign and the work that we were doing. And my objective through it had been to raise as much money as possible for the charity that I'd been working with in Uganda. Um, but also, of course, what we were seeing is that we'd stepped out and that we'd, we'd had to kind of find the, the local teams in Nairobi and in Cape Town who were making the, the shells of the bags, which were then being lined in Europe with Mulberry. And it was creating skills. It was enhancing local talent. It was creating livelihoods for these guys. And I think that was really the, the, the sort of early formulation in my mind of, of the blueprint of what we were trying to do. And really in the absence at that point of any kind of social enterprise models, it was like, wow, this works. And one of the most important things that I was probably ever told is that people love to be asked for their advice. You know, you're really, you're giving them an opportunity to share that, you know, their experience and everything that, that they've learned through the hardships of, of, you know, anything that we do. So ask for advice when you're out there. Salvador is, if you like, the capital of Bahia. Um, and Itapua, which was a favela, 
um, that, that we discovered by chance because we were looking for, we'd done this record and we were looking for grassroots education projects to support locally and, and came across this little health center and this young guy running it called Luciano, um, we became mates with him and we were hanging out on this, this trip to Brazil. And um, on, this same, on this same fateful journey, if you like, we discovered these bags made from ring pulls on a craft market. So the material um, that the bags are made from, or one of our signature materials, is recycled ring pulls from, from cans. So the one that you can see on the screen, of course, was in its raw silver form, and we were immediately fascinated by the opportunity. Luckily, we'd met someone, Luciano, on the ground who knew all of the women in the, in the community, and he said, guys, listen, I think the ladies here would love the opportunity to learn this skill, and if that led to a, to a source of income, then amazing. Um, so we said, okay, great, we'll, we'll pay for the, the training, you know, for the first lessons um, in the crochet work, which holds the, the ring pulls together, um, and off we went. Uh, one of our trustees of the charity, who then became the chairman of our social enterprise, um, had been the CEO of Liberty Department Store. Um, again, we'd gone out looking for people um, who, within our network or our network's network, um, could really add value to what we were doing with Bottle Top. And we were getting huge interest in these ring pull bags. It was really, you know, something that was catching the imagination even more strongly than it had done with the original Mulberry campaign. But how to take that to a luxury level? We reached out and worked with uh, the ex-head of accessory design from Louis Vuitton, um, and we tasked him with creating a, a signature collection still using our ring pulls in a way that was decorative, that was still structural, but enabled us to move into a, into a new division of bags. And that was one of the first designs. So we took one of his team over to Brazil, spent time working with and training the ladies at our community center, really upskilling them, making them the technicians. Now, Five or so years later, they're, far, they're, more, ta they're more highly talented um, and more highly skilled, I would say, than, than the team in Paris. And when I came here, I thought there'll be no more environmental work for me to do because surely the UK is so civilized and so, you know, so advanced that there just won't be any environmental problems to fix. But in the year that I arrived, there was 100 million tons of waste that went to landfill. And this really took me way, way, way back to my youth when my favorite Saturday activity would be going to a landfill site with my dad. And it was just the first place, I guess, as a prairie girl that I ever saw seagulls. So I always associated seagulls with rubbish, not with the sea. Um, I also learned to love this kind of sickly sweet smell of domestic refuse. So there's certain things that stay with you when, when, when you when you grow up. And lots of people have ideas of coming to London and going to see Big Ben and the Tower and things like that. The first place that I visited was the Victorian sewers. Um, second pay place was the waste transfer station in Battersea. So you can tell what kinds of things that I might be interested in. I've been to the National Gallery too, it's lovely, but the things that I really, really love is the waste. So what we do is not about uh, any particular industry. It's about three things. It's about rescuing material, preventing it from going to landfill. I love materials. I cherish materials. I feel very, very bad for my partner Elvis because I bring all of this crap home to our house and I force him to turn it into something else, whether that be a handbag or renewable fuel or packaging or something for somebody else. The second thing that we do is make all these things. The third thing that we do is donate 50% of our profits to charity. So as this cycle of the business started, we started by taking London's fire hose because although I wanted to take 100 million tons of waste, I couldn't, you know, I've got two legs and two arms and I couldn't drive, so I didn't even have a van. Um, I thought that London's fire hose would be something I could fix on my own. It's a 10 ton a year waste problem. But it still took me from 2005 until 2010 until we had solved London's fire hose problem but solve it we have. We've created a sustainable business and a lovely brand that it manages to collect not just London's fire hose, but fire hose from across the country and across Europe and now in, even into the US um, and transform that hose into, into beautiful pieces. And once we had the fire hose thing going, uh, I suppose I'm a waste junkie, so I go back for more waste. 
because the fire hose system was working. But what are the things that we're good at doing? Collecting waste, innovating with it, and turning um, that into profit, and then half of that money we give away. And that means that our life is about waste. So if anyone here is thinking about starting a business, you have to start a business that involves things you're interested in. Everybody here has said the same thing. They, they were on journeys, they were traveling, they found something that they fell in love with and they kept going with it. These are all difficult journeys as well. I mean, I've been doing this for uh, since, well, I've been running businesses since I was 22 and I'm 37 now. Um, but I, I've been running Firehose since 2004, since I first came here. And it's a long journey and it's really, really difficult. So unless you love it, there's no point in doing it. And there's also no point, in my view, in setting up a business unless that business is going to solve something. This is a world filled with problems. The world as it is isn't good enough for the next generation that's coming through. I don't think that we're passing on anything that's all too hot or special at the moment. So if you're not going to start a business that's going to have a positive impact on the world, don't start a business. I don't think we have room or space for more stuff or more ideas that don't contribute to a better, a better world.